I have questions. Yes. I have good. so many, yeah. but I'd like to start with a little bit of a reading out of the oh, all right. silver I, anniversary. I'll, I'll be happy. Yeah, silver anniversary. Um, I took the jacket off so I wouldn't remind myself what I looked like when I, when I <laughs> wrote the book. I had forgotten the original photo had a double exposure, so that it's me and there's this, a ghost image of me in the back. Oh boy. Right. That I guess was supposed to be sp spooky or, or something. <laughs> that I submitted to, obviously a first debut novelist uh, kind of rookie mistake to do. Yeah, you can do whatever you'd like with the photo. <laughs> Double image, sounds fun. Um, I'm really happy to, to be here. Thank you all for coming. I'm um, really glad to be here with the editor of the Parish Review since, as we'll probably mention, uh, this book, The Virgin Suicides, began in the, in the Parish Review, the first chapter of this was my second publication. And there it is, amazing it's still held together. The glue must have been very good quality. Um, so it's, it's a meaningful connection to me, always has been, and that I'm on the board um, of the Parish Review partly because of, because of that, because I know from experience how important the magazine is to, to young and undiscovered writers. Um, I'm just going to read a, a little bit of this book and um, I'm not going to explain anything about it. Maybe you saw the movie, you'll kind of know what's going on. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, in the daytime, the Lisbon house looked vacant. The trash the family put out once a week, also in the middle of the night because no one saw them, not even Uncle Tucker, looked more and more like the refuse of people resigned to a long siege. They were eating canned lima beans. They were flavoring rice with sloppy joe mix. At night, when the lights signaled, we racked our brains for a way of contacting the girls. Tom Faheen suggested flying a kite with a message alongside the house, but this was voted down on logistical grounds. Little Johnny Buell offered the recourse of tossing the same message on a rock through the girls' windows, but we were afraid the breaking glass would alert Mrs. Lisbon. In the end, the answer was so simple, it took a week to come up with. We called them on the telephone. In the Larson's sun-faded phone book, right between Liquor and Little, we found the intact listing for Lisbon, Ronald A. It sat halfway down the right-hand page, unmarked by any code or symbol, not even an asterisk referring to an appendix of pain. We stared at it for some time, then, Three index fingers at once, we dialed. The telephone tolled 11 times before Mr. Lisbon answered. What's it gonna be today, he said right away in a tired voice. His speech was slurred. We covered the phone and said nothing. I'm waiting. Today I'll listen to all your crap. Another click sounded on the line like a door opening onto a hollow corridor. Look, give us a break, will you? Mr. Lisbon muttered. There was a pause. Assorted breathing, mechanically reformulated, met in electronic space. Then Mr. Lisbon spoke in a voice unlike his own, a high screech. Mrs. Lisbon had grabbed the receiver. Why won't you leave us alone? She shouted and slammed down the phone. We stayed on. For five more seconds, her furious breath blew through the receiver, but just as we expected, the line didn't go dead. On the other end, an obscure presence waited. We called out a tentative hello. After a moment, a faint, crippled voice returned, Hi. We hadn't heard the Lisbon girls speak in a long time, but the voice didn't jog our memories. It sounded, perhaps because the speaker was whispering, irreparably altered, diminished, the voice of a child fallen down a well. We didn't know which girl it was and didn't know what to say. Still, we hung on together, her, them, us, and at some adjacent recess in the Bell telephone system, another line connected. A man began talking underwater to a woman. We could half hear their conversation. I thought maybe a salad, a salad, you're killing me with these salads. But then another circuit must have freed because the couple were shunted off suddenly, leaving us in buzzing silence. And the voice, raw but stronger now, said, Shit, see you later. And the phone was hung up. We called again next day at the same time and were answered 
on the first ring. We waited a moment for safety's sake, then proceeded with the plan we'd devised the night before, holding the phone to one of Mr. Larson's speakers. We played the song which most thoroughly communicated our feelings to the Lisbon girls. We can't remember the song's title now, and an extensive search through records of the period has proved unsuccessful. We do, however, recall the essential sentiments, which spoke of hard days, long nights, a man waiting outside a broken telephone booth hoping it would somehow ring, and rain, and rainbows. It was mostly guitars except for one interlude where a mellow cello hummed. We played it into the phone, and then Chase Buell gave our number, and we hung up. Next day, same time, our phone rang. We answered it immediately, and after some confusion, the phone was dropped, heard a needle bump down on a record, and the voice of Gilbert O'Sullivan singing through scratches. You may recall the song, a ballad which charts the misfortunes of a young man's life. His parents die, his fiancée stands him up at the altar, each verse leaving him more and more alone. It was Mrs. Eugene's favorite, and we knew it well from hearing her singing it over her simmering pots. The song never meant much to us, speaking as it did of an age we hadn't reached. But once we heard it playing tinily through the receiver, coming from the Lisbon girls, the song made an impact. Gilbert O'Sullivan's elfin voice sounded high enough to be a girl's. The lyrics might have been diary entries the girls whispered into our ears. Though it wasn't their voices we heard, the song conjured their images more vividly than ever. We could feel them on the other end, blowing dust off the needle, holding the telephone over the spinning black disc, playing the volume low so as not to be overheard. When the song stopped, the needle skated through the inner ring, sending out a repeating click, like the same, lived, same time lived over and over again. Already, Joe Larson had our response ready, and after we played it, the Lisbon girls played theirs, and the evening went on like that. Most of the songs we've forgotten, but a portion of that contrapuntal exchange survives in pencil on the back of Demo Carafilis's Tea for the Tillerman, where he jotted it. We provide it here. The Lisbon girls, alone again naturally, Gilbert O'Sullivan. Us, you've got a friend, James Taylor. The Lisbon girls, where do the children play? Cat Stevens. Us, dear Prudence, the Beatles. The Lisbon girls, candle in the wind, Elton John. Us, wild horses, the Rolling Stones. The Lisbon girls, at 17, Janice Ian. Us, time in a bottle, Jim Croce. The Lisbon girls, so far away, Carol King. Actually, we're not sure about the order. Demo Carafilis scribbled the titles haphazardly. The above order, however, does chart the basic progression of our musical conversation. Because Lux had burned her hard rock, the girls' songs were mostly folk music. Stark, plaintive voices sought justice and equality. An occasional fiddle evoked the country the country had once been. The singers had bad skin or wore boots. Song after song throbbed with secret pain. We passed the sticky receiver from ear to ear. The drum beat so regular we might have been pressing our ears to the girls' chests. Occasionally we thought we heard them singing along, and it was almost like being at a concert with them. Our songs, for the most part, were love songs. Each selection tried to turn the conversation in a more intimate direction. But the Lisbon girls kept to impersonal topics. We leaned in and commented on their perfume. They said it was probably the magnolias. After a while, our songs turned sadder and sappier. That was when the girls played so far away. We noted the shift at once. They had let their hand linger on our wrist and followed with bridge over troubled water, turning up the volume because the song expressed more than any other how we felt about the girls, how we wanted to help them. When it finished, we waited for their response. After a long pause, their turntable began grinding again, and we heard the song which, even now, in the Muzak of Malls, makes us stop and stare back into a lost time. Hey, have you ever tried really reaching out for the other side? I may be climbing on rainbows, but baby, here goes. 
Dreams there for those who sleep, life it's for us to keep. And if you're wondering what this song is leading to, I want to make it with you. The line went dead. Without warning, the girls had thrown their arms around us, confessed hotly into our ears, and fled the room. For some minutes, we stood motionless, listening to the buzz of the telephone line. Then it began to beep angrily, and a recording told us to hang up our phone and hang it up now. We had never dreamed that the girls might love us back. The notion made us dizzy, and we lay down on the Larson's carpet, which smelled of pet deodorizer and deeper down of pet. For a long time, no one spoke. But little by little, as we shifted bits of information in our heads, we saw things in a new light. Hadn't the girls invited us to their party last year? Hadn't they known our names and addresses? Rubbing spy holes in grimy windows, hadn't they been looking out to see us? We forgot ourselves and held hands, smiling with closed eyes. On the stereo, Garfunkel began hitting his high notes, and we didn't think of Cecilia. We thought only of Mary, Bonnie, Lux, and Therese, stranded in life, unable to speak to us until now, in this inexact, shy fashion. We went over their last months in school, coming up with new recollections. Lux had forgotten her math book one day and had to share with Tom Fahim. In the margin, she had written, I want to get out of here. How far did that wish extend? Thinking back, we decided the girls had been trying to talk to us all along to elicit our help, but we'd been too infatuated to listen. Our surveillance had been so focused, we missed nothing but a simple returned gaze. Who else did they have to turn to? Not their parents, nor the neighborhood. Inside their house, they were prisoners, outside lepers. And so they hid from the world, waiting for someone, for us, to save them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm amazed at the technological changes in the phone in phones since I wrote wrote the book. Yeah, I mean, probably people now. don't know that you could other you sometimes hear other conversations on the phone, or that you could hang up and still be on the line. Do people know? You know, it's like I think they still know really? that. Really? Do they know that? Um, okay. It's like I can tell you how to churn butter as well. It's sort of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask yeah. about that us. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know you were going to read that passage, but it, it's it's kind of perfect because uh, can I just see show of hands who's read the book? Everyone, almost everyone. Hooray! Um, us and the the collective we of mm -hmm. the narrator. How did you get there? How how did that come to be? How did it work for you? Well, the, the book came to me in, in a couple of streams. I first got the idea for the book by talking to an actual teenager who was babysitting my, my nephew. Mm -hmm. And she told me that she, was, um, that she had tried to commit suicide and all her sisters had tried to commit suicide. And um, it was, you know, I was obviously amazed by that story and I didn't know I, it was the only time I had met her. So I just started thinking about that, that narrative and uh, maybe a year, a year and a half later, I sat down and, and started writing it in the in the we voice. I, 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 there, often I can't write something unless I find the the voice that um, seems to contain the story itself or seems to know what the story is. And on on that day when I when I started writing it in the we, I suddenly could could feel the the suburb or the little town where, where the story happened. And then by ex experimenting with it, I started to narrow the focus. At first it was everybody in the town was, was recalling this event. So the parents and Everyone, different ages. It was oh, just wow. like a village, a village narrator. But then I, I realized that I, the, the, um, the most heat was being generated whenever it was in an adolescent male or, or middle-aged arrested development male male voice that's that's when it became most most interesting so i sort of narrowed the focus just to the boys and then for a while i lost my nerve and i thought maybe one of them would would step out and speak on behalf of the others but i i, I recognized pretty quickly that was a 
like an abdication of, of what, what the voice was doing, that it was better if you didn't know who was, who was speaking. Um, and the, the old, in the old days of the New Yorker, the talk of the town used to be in a, in a we voice. Now, we noticed... Oh, right. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we noticed uh, last week at the library that blah, blah. so there's this kind of strange, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know, avuncular um, voice that that I, that appealed to me, and so I just I just kept kept it that way. I just narrowed it, but I kept it a wee, and I I didn't make it specific. Um, did you sort of? It, it's set in the late '60s. Did you have a moment in time that it was set? Specifically, I know there's one reference to the presidential situation. Yeah, it's, actually, it's probably um, like 74, 73 70, or 74. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, but they're speaking from a moment far into the future, maybe 25 years yeah, or so. Th they're probably in their early 40s. Okay. And, and um, remembering their time in the, in the I, I, I imagine someone older than I was when I wrote it. I was in my late 20s, early 30s. And I imagine someone about 45 thinking back. It, it, it describes their, their uh, slight decrepitude sometimes. Right. Yeah. I guess 25 years later. Yeah. Um, yeah, now I'm older than the narrator. Now, I, used to be now younger. You're older. I used to be younger than the narrator. Do you narrator. think that sort of the, the presentation of that future version of the young <laughs> men holds up 25 years later? Um, I, I think there's some moments, right, where I'm thinking of Trip Fontaine yeah. in the desert. Some of the things horribly came true. Yeah. You know, um, the people who, you know, I based some of the characters on, I made bets about what would happen to them in their lives. And when I go back for my high school reunions, I, I see that that actually happened in a lot of cases. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit frightening sometimes. Okay. Um, so pivoting then to the them, the, yeah. the five Lisbon sisters. Did yeah. the five, did that number come from the story as well? Um, from the babysitter? Um, I, no, she didn't specify how many sisters she had. I guess, I think there's this really interesting and exciting thing that um, there's five and they yeah. all have their own personalities as, as um, demonstrated in that passage, details of each woman. But at other moments that come together as a collective. Yeah. How did you sort of tease that out, find, find those personalities, and the weave between the individual and the collective voice yeah. of the Lisbons? You know, because it was my, f my first book and I didn't know what I was doing, I gave myself a lot of rules and, 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 li and limitations which helped, helped me write the book. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to write a book where I actually made each each girl psychologically distinct and and um, created five separate and indelible characters. So it was better if I did it from a distance. And the fuzziness that sometimes overcomes the girls is is a a product of the boys not really understanding them. Um, the boys are you know fascinated by the girls. They're obsessed with them, but they don't they don't really get them. And they don't really know them. They kind of merge in their in their fevered imaginations into a collective. And that was easier for me to for me to do, um, and so that's that's how I approached it. I thought it was it was both appropriate and accurate about a, a teenage um, understanding of of the opposite sex, and it, it was also made it easier to, to write write the book in a sense. When when you set up those rules, was that from the outset, or was that something that came through revision that you realized you had to tease more out or set set a a wall or put a fog it was between. what no it was what allowed me to to write a, write the book i i knew that I, the boys would not know anything except what someone told them mm. what they found in a diary or something lying around town or what they had exp experienced um so it, it limited the number of things i i could tell okay. which actually helped helped me to write the book because i don't think in my later novels i got to a, a capacity where i could go into people's heads and, and, and try to describe their thought processes and, and, and present human character in a, in a different way. But this was just voyeuristic in a sense. Um, I also didn't know myself very well mm -hmm. as a young writer, so it was better if I kept my own self out of, this, out of the story and just talked about what I knew. I knew a lot about my neighborhood. I knew about all the strange things that had happened. Um, and I, I felt on, on safer ground with yeah. that. 
So you set up a lot of rules. You did, yeah. I would say, break one rule, which is yeah. to say, gave away everything in the very first yes. sentence. Yes. Um, that was also helping me because then I knew what I had to write about. You, okay. See, I got to kill these five people characters <laughs> off, you know. That was the biggest difficulty was that at first I was having them commit suicide in succession every chapter or so and it became very monotonous and to do that so then I didn't <laughs> yeah, I have Cecilia die in chapter one and then they don't I can say this since everyone seems to have read the book I don't you know they don't die until the end of the book so it created a suspense because the reader thinks I thought these people were supposed to commit suicide but I've only got 10 pages left and they and they haven't right. so that was the, the the plot I had to figure out that I didn't know when I began. I mean, I knew what would happen. I didn't know how it was going to happen. Okay. Um, you you mentioned this before you started reading. This this book has had several lives. It it was a story, and it won. It wasn't just published in the Paris Review. It won the best story of the year, the Aga Khan, that year. Um, and then it was a book, and then it was a movie, and now it's a book again in this 25th anniversary edition right. with a new intro from Emma. Klein, um, can you talk sort of about the emotional, um, as as the writer, as the author yeah. of of many iterations, how how it's felt to go on the ride with the Virgin Suicides? I was just um, we were talking. I was just in in France last last week, and we were talking about. It. I ran to um, John Irving was there, and he's been doing a little fortieth anniversary t tour of the um, world according to Garp, mm -hmm. and he said, "Oh God, forty year, you know, it's making me feel really old." And I said, well, you know, the opposite is just to be forgotten. So you should be, ha you should be happy that people are doing a 40th anniversary. So I'm, that, that's how I, I feel about it, that it keeps either surviving or changing into different forms. There, there's a lot of stage productions of it, too. I mean, I certainly didn't, I didn't envision any of that, and I didn't even think it was going to be a published book when I was writing it. The one nice, nice thing about writing your first book is that nobody cares if you write it and you don't know if it will actually be finished or it will become a book and there's a freedom in that it's a, a kind of state that I try to retain when when I'm writing that state of innocence about about work but you you don't have to f try to have it you just do have it when you write your first book right. um, the names of the characters were all the names of my best friends when I wrote the manuscript I just thought well, it doesn't matter. No one's going to publish this, so I'll just call it they the guy that, that? It, that it was. And then I changed the names <laughs> oh, okay. right at the end. Unless it was a very good friend who I know would not sue me. Um, <laughs> I kept, I, cha I changed the names. Okay. Yeah. So after but, the expectation um, was fulfilled, after this became a yeah. big success, um, looking at your bibliography, I bet you jump back into short stories, several of which are featured... Mm -hmm. and fresh complaint. Can mm -hmm. you talk about toggling between the virgin suicides and stories, getting sort of ramping up for your next novel? I, I think I was pretty quickly writing Middlesex after um, I finished the virgin suicides, but then having enough trouble with it that, that I was also doing stories just, just to finish things and see if I could finish something. One of the stories in, in fresh complaint precedes the virgin suicides. Um, a story called Capricious Gardens, which is the first thing I ever published. Right. I wrote in, in graduate school, so f a few years before I started working on The Virgin Suicides. Um, and then the stories in general were written mainly not between books, but, but just at times where I was stuck on a novel and needed, needed some distance from it. Um, and that's why they're written over so, so many different so many different years. Um, it wasn't as though I w it was, just, now I'm just gonna write stories. I just wrote them now and then. Um, usually in periods of some despondency, which I think is some, somehow communicated in the desperation of many of the characters <laughs> in the book. There, there's some bad news for some of these guys, that's yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was interesting also. Um, can you talk about Detroit? Sure, yeah. Um, Visa V, The Virgin Suicides of Middlesex, and then um, meanwhile, in Fresh Complaint, you go all over the world. There's Ireland, there's mm -hmm. um, Southeast Asia, there's France. How does plant place settle for different stories? How do you come to that? Well, with the, with the Virgin Suicides, I 
it, it was the, the fact that it was the first time I set something, not the first time, but almost the first time I set something in Detroit. When I was growing up, I didn't necessarily know that Detroit was fertile ground for, for literature. It, it didn't seem um, to, to, to be on the level of all the great cities that I, that I read about. It wasn't, it wasn't Dublin, it wasn't London. And then it be, began to occur to me that it sort of was Dublin in, in, in many ways. Um, it was a city I knew, and it and and um, it was just as as meaningful as any other to write about. So, once I started writing about Detroit, I suddenly knew what I was writing about. I tended, when I was very young writer, to try to put place stories in kind of nowhere land, some sort of Camus-like mm -hmm. existential desert or something, where I thought the interest would be in the the angst of the character and and, and in fact I, I i i was not that angst filled a young young person i didn't know anything about myself so the, there was neither setting nor character in 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 these stories hence they were not very interesting and then with virgin suicides maybe because i met that that babysitter at home in, in gross point i set the story there and suddenly i knew what what the landscape was um and then subsequently realized that Detroit, if I wrote about Detroit, I could get at so many major ingredients of American history. You know, r racial tension, industrialization, music, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of different things were, were right, right there when I, when I was growing up. Um, in The Virgin Suicides, I don't name the town. It's, it's um, just an unspecified large Midwestern industrial town that's, that's turning into the Rust Belt. People can identify it if they're from Detroit. And then with, with Middlesex, I just made it very explicit, and Detroit is really uh, almost a, just the main feature of, of that book, the history of Detroit. And, and um, you have to have the history of the Detroit to have the, the story of Middlesex happen. How does it feel to write about other places then? Um, uh, it feels... It feels I mean, I had never been to Ireland when I wrote the first story, or maybe I'd been there once. Um, I, sometimes people will tell me stories about, about where they've been, and I'll, and I'll write a story without having gone there. Um, I don't know. I, I took a trip. I took a year off from college and traveled the world, so some of that has lingered with me, both in the story Airmail, where the, where the young man is in Thailand and, and has amoebic dysentery. That's that comes from my own time traveling and part of the the marriage plot where the character Mitchell goes to India and works with Mother Teresa is also from my life. So my my travels sometimes get into my work after a, 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 a wait of about 20 years. I finally write about it. Um, I'm happiest writing about Detroit usually, but I haven't lived there since I was 18. So I was going to say, can, yeah. you, can you talk about contemporary Detroit and the transformation it's going through now? Um, as as a resident, a former yeah. resident, um, will it show up in your fiction again? I've been I've been I'm going there in a, in a couple of weeks. I was there last last June, and there is a lot of things changing. Um, but if you're if you're a real Detroiter, you you remain um, not immune, but slightly resistant to the hype of of the you know how how easy it will be to bring back a city like that. I mean. It used to be the fourth biggest city in the, in America, and mm -hmm. when I was born, it was the the richest city per capita in this in, in in the nation, which seems amazing. And now there's a lot of activity downtown and a lot of good things happening, but the city is is pretty vast. Huge parts of it are are still um, you know hurting hurting pretty bad. So when I go back, I see the I see the promising signs, but I'm I'm like painfully aware of, of all the all the problems in terms of the you know the, the school system and and uh, the the tax base the amount of money the city has to run on is you know is inadequate so I I, 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 I can't just think it's an easy an easy uh, road back for the city though it's been moving in the right direction it's a lot better than it used to be okay um, I thought it was interesting um, how you revisited the uh, teenage protagonist in Fresh Complaint. Or there's a new teenage protagonist or character. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk about sort of the, the political environment 
uh, of writing the most recent stories and, and maybe compare it to writing The Virgin Suicides 25 years ago? Well, the, the most recent stories in the, in the collection are the, f the first story and, and the last. Um, and I th you know, there's, two kinds of, there's two kinds of short stories, I think, um, that a person can write. One is, a, sh is a, a short bit of, you know, chronicles a short bit of time that suggests an entire life. And the other kind of story is a more, um, a, a story that really encompasses a, an entire life and shrinks it down into a short space. So I have both of those in this collection, but the first and the last stories, um, I thought of them as novels. I thought this could, be a, this could be a novel, but I'm not going to make it a novel. I'm just going to take out everything except the, the, the essentials of, 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 of what happens and, s and see if I can get that feeling of, of density and time passing. So the first story, which is about a friendship of two old, older women, comprises about 40 years of their life and, and, and friendship. And the story is, it's long for a short story, it's 30 or 35 pages, but it's, it's obviously not a novel. But it, that's how, I, that's how I, I, I thought about it. Um, I'm not really answering your question about the okay. um, teenage protagonist, but I, I, I guess I saw it um, from a, when I'm writing The Virgin Suicides, I am the teenager. And when I, when I was writing Fresh Complaint, I'm, I'm the, the adult of, of, a, of a daughter. It was, ma it was I, I thought mainly about my daughter's generation and how she would behave and the things that she would say and what she might be like um, growing up at, the, at, at that time. So it, was, it, it kind of shifted it a bit, um, shifted the perspective. Are there other ways that parenthood has changed your... Yeah, I, mean, I probably wouldn't write The Virgin Suicides when you, when you have a daughter. You're not going to get up every day like, oh, I think I'll write about a suicidal girl. Yeah. I think it's definitely a you know, pre-parental uh, exercise of a book. <laughs> I think so. Um, what is a post-parental or a parental exercise of a book? What, can you talk about what you're working on next? Um, Unfortunately, you know, you, you end up being the writer that, that you have to be more than the one you, you want to be. And I, I try to escape the 70s and, and my adolescence, but I, I don't successfully ever get away so from that. So we're still in the 70s. I am telling a story about the 70s. I have one story that has been given to me by virtue of being alive that is a complete story. I mean, like a very surprising thing happened to me and to the people I, I, I grew up with. And I've never been able to tell it because it's a delicate matter. And I've found a way now that I'm old enough to tell it in a retrospective fashion. It's not unlike The Virgin Suicides in that way. It's an older narrator talking about his, his adolescence as well as what he's going through now in, 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 in middle age. But it, it has a kind of it has a, a kind of distance that allows me to get at some of the material that seemed to be, if not too upsetting, then, then too, um, too revealing for, for me to write it bef before. But I am, I am still in the, in the 70s. It seems to be a time that I like. That's okay. <laughs> it's um, okay. <laughs> I, I know another place that um, you talk about this in your Paris Review, Art of Fiction interview, and, and reading your, your novels and your stories over the years, I can see this as well, sort of swinging and trying to find a place between modernism and realism, mm -hmm. Joyce and Tolstoy. Do you have a sense of where this next project might be? And do you have any updates, I guess, on that sort of pendulum swinging between those two poles? I, I used to think about these things a little bit more, what's the word? Um, not intellectually, but I used to think about writing a postmodern novel, but trying to inject it with um, realistic elements and emotional elements that were more like an old-fashioned realistic novel, as though you could kind of create a, a hybrid form of, of writing that would have some of the, the narrative pull of an old-fashioned novel, but the, the knowing um, 
irony of a postmodern novel. N n now I feel as though it's all in the tone and, and that there's the, the, the amalgamation that you can come to with writing is, is a more subtle mixing of elements so that um, you, you, won't, you won't see a kind of transformer-like um, creation of two different entities shoved together. I don't know what the transformers are, so I shouldn't even use that as a, as a metaphor, but I think it has to do with different pieces of something put together. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it's like a, yeah. a, a robot guy and then it's a truck. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if, if the old novels were more like a robot guy and a truck put, put together, but now um, it's more like some shape-shifting metal that, that changes form without it ever um, ceasing to be what it is, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. I, it's closer to the, to le, to the language um, moving between the various ways of writing so that the, the reader won't really know what, what she or he is reading. This sounds mystical and strange. I it understand. does, and but, I'm intrigued. Is that, um, is that intuitive? Is that from through revision that you're, you're shifting that shape? Is that um, based on things you're reading, not in a theoretical way, but just in, an, in a creative um, oh. space? Like, oh, how, how did that shift come to be? Say that, ask, say that again. Oh, boy. Um, and I'll see if I... <laughs> that you you have this new approach yeah. to, to writing um how how do you follow that shape shifting now as you're writing is it just purely following your nose as it were or is it through is it sentence level or is it thinking really more about the structure of each project as it goes it's kind it's kind of all those things at once it comes about because of a lot of rewriting and a lot of th throwing out of um of drafts and projects that are, that aren't working because something seems seems rotten or or, in, or untruthful about it, um, and then inching inching your way to to a voice that is capable of exp expressing the range of feelings that you have. I mean, what what I what I find when I'm writing is I can try different things and do different things, but each one seems seems limited to me or it seems only part of, of my, only partly expressive of, of myself. So I'm trying to get to a voice that would be fully expressive of every range that I feel from, from comic to tragic. Um, and it's, and, and it's, it's just difficult to, to get that sound. I, I guess to use a, another, analogy is if you were creating a band and you were trying to get a certain sound by using lots of different instruments, you would play around until finally the, the sound was there and then that was the sound that you, that you wanted. It's more of a, a feeling like that, like groping toward, toward a sound. And then the sound gives you a fluency and by the, the fluency indicates that you're on the, on the right, right road. It goes back to a little bit of what I said about the voice of the Virgin Suicides, is when you finally get the tone and the voice, it, it knows more than you do, and you, and you follow that, that voice, um, and, and it, it tells you where to, where to go. Um, and, and, that, and then you can, can get into the project and be able to write it. Um, that makes sense. Uh, it makes no sense at all. It, it makes some sense. You uh, talking about the band and, and going back to what you read in terms of music. Is yeah. music always in your writing? Is it something you're thinking about? I, I'm actually not big. I don't think I don't put, play music when I when I write or think about music. I'm just using it now because um, I thought it was the right d description of it. But I don't think that I'm. Um, I don't think music comes into how I think about writing at all. Okay. Yeah. It is a good metaphor in certain scenes, and I think that those song titles and, and the lyrics implied by them. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, yeah. I mean, it's a part of my part of my life, and I was usually in the old days. I used to sing. It was the best of bread that song. I used to sing that, but I did not have the guts to sing it tonight. <laughs> um, but I used to do that. Oh. Oh. But they're recording tonight, so I'm worried about that. <laughs> 
Okay, we have 15 minutes left. Okay, I'm going to be more concrete in my answers to the uh, audience. Um, you've probably uh, answered this a few times, but can you talk about what it was like to see the novel on screen? Well, I saw it a number of times. The first time I saw it was at a screening in San Francisco um, before that came out that Sofia Coppola arranged. And I'd obviously never seen you know, a, a book of mine filmed. And it was just, it was a strange experience because you see it and um, it's an uncanny feeling because the, the characters might be speaking lines you've written and those lines might correspond to your actual memory of life. And yet they're completely denatured by the fact that they're coming out of actresses' mouths or, or actors' mouths who, who, who you, know, you didn't imagine, you didn't know. So you, you recognize it and you're estranged from it at, at the same time. So the, you know, the writer is maybe the last person who can, can judge if the movie's any good mm. and in that, at, at, that initial, at that initial stage. So I, had, I was just kind of slightly freaked out when I first saw it, I guess Fair you could enough. describe. And then, um, then I saw it again at the premiere and I was able to see it more as a movie and I, I began to, to like it. There were certain things I liked immediately. The, the um, soundtrack by Air that I thought was wonderful and it also made the movie fresh and didn't, didn't date it, didn't keep it a period piece where it's all 70s music and it, it just sounded, sounded wonderful. Um, some of the performances I, I, I really liked, and the atmosphere of, of the movie um, I liked. But I still had this this inability to see it as a movie because I, I was too invested in, in different ways. And then finally, um, I saw it when I lived in Berlin. I came in one night, not entirely sober, to my to my apartment, and I turned on German TV, and they had. Uh, the Virgin Suicides on television, dubbed, dubbed in German. I was going to say, was it dubbed or was it, it was, subtitled? It was awesome that, in that way. <laughs> I stayed up and, and watched it. And then I yeah. could, started to see it as, as a movie. So, yeah. I mean, I had a good experience with, with that filming. I, I, I admire Sof Sophia a lot. I like all of her films. And she, you know, a, a movie is not the book. It's someone's own work of art that's inspired by your book. And it took me, you know, a, a little while to realize that that's what it has to be. It has to be a good movie. Hopefully it's not violating your, your story, but it's, it's um, commensurate and, and um, faith, faithful to, to the idea and the, and the feeling of, of, of your book. And that's what, that's what she did. You know, she liked the book and she wanted to, to make it into a film. And you have to change a lot of things. The girls in the film have a solidity and a reality that they don't in, in the book because they're played by flesh and blood people. And the point of view goes into the house, you see the family, and you think this is what's really happening, this is what really happened in, the, in that house. But in the book you're never quite sure what happened and if the boys have it right or have it wrong. So things change a great deal, especially if you have a narrative voice as I do that's that's so strange. There's no, there's no way to do that cinematically. Mm -hmm. So it just has to be a, a different, a, you know, as I said, a di different piece of work of art that comes out of the book. There were so many details, though, of that house and of of their lives. And this will be my last question because yes. just as as a writer, I, I was curious how you did the all of the exhibits. Mm -hmm. Did you have the whole list drawn out and then just inserted a few? I, I thought that sort of museum was fascinating, um, but how did you build out the, those specific details and catalog them I, as, I, as an yeah. author? I didn't have a cabinet of curiosities that I was referring to. I just came up with them as I, as I wrote it okay. um, and ima imagined them, imagined the boys having them, but I did, I, it wasn't it wasn't around in my in my house. There were certain things that happened. Um, the the Virgin Mary cards that mm -hmm. that the boys have um, that start appearing around town. That was a real thing that I that I saw. I think I found one on the on the sidewalk of New York when I and I 
So sometimes things in my life would, would appear as the exhibits. I hope the moldy sandwich didn't appear um, at the top of the stairs. There's been a lot of moldy sandwiches in my life, so I'm sure, I'm sure that was real. Yeah. I'm sure that was real, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'd thank love you. to give the audience a chance for some questions. Yes, I'm going to repeat your question because they, they asked me to for the recording, so <laughs> after you. Is it easier or harder for you to write today? Is it easier or harder for me to write today? I would say it's harder for me to write today just because sitting here talking about my first book, um, I'm, I'm recalling like somehow I wrote that, that book. Like it was probably difficult, but I don't, re I don't remember the difficulty now. I had a nine to five job and I worked at night and, and on the weekends. And um, after a few years, it somehow got written. I think when you write your first book, you don't know how you did it. It just somehow you did it. And then the second book is the one where you teach yourself that, that you are a writer. Um, but it hasn't, be, hasn't become any, any easier. Maybe it's the same level of difficulty. Certainly not easier. I know it's not easier. Maybe it's the same terrible hardness. <laughs> Yeah. I can imagine that often you wrote questions to the uh, People ask you how you ever going to be able to talk that. How did that make you feel? Or didn't people ask you? Um, the question is, after I wrote Virgin Suicides, did people ask me how could I top that and how did I feel about that? I don't remember them asking me, <laughs> asking me that. There was that thing about the second book syndrome that everyone talked about. And it took me a god awful amount of time to write my second book, but also took a terrible amount of time to write my third book. So I don't know that there is a second book um, problem. There's just a eugenities problem that I, that I have. Um, I don't know. It, you, it, it's always the same. Like you're trying to write a, a, a good book, and it f fills you with anxiety the same amount each time you, you're writing a new book. Um, I've been asked to, after the Pulitzer, wasn't there more pressure? And there's not more pressure, it's just the same, the same pressure. Um, John Barth said that writers go from, they alternate between overweening, what is it? Overweening exuberance to utter despair, something like that. And that's, that's so true. I mean, on that one day, depending on how it goes, you think this is, this is great. I'm a great writer, or I'm a terrible writer. This is ter this is the worst thing that's ever been written, and emotionally, that's just what it's like, day to day, week to week, year to year. Um, so you just get used to feeling that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the the question is about Middlesex, the complexity of the plot, and, and whether I plotted it all out before I, I wrote it or or not. The the answer is that I had a basic structure in mind with, with Middlesex. Um I I had the idea to write a story narrated by an intersex narrator, someone who's, who's born female and, and becomes male. Unlike the books that I had read that, in, in which a, a gender switch occurred, I wanted to write about a real person and be accurate about the, the medical details, the, the biology and, 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 and the genetics. So I did a lot of research at, at the medical library, trying to find a condition that would, that would cause this. And then I, you know, but I thought it would be a slim book at that point, a, a kind of slim fictional autobiography of an intersex person. Then I came across this um, condition, 5-alpha reductase deficiency syndrome, um, and that was the one that I decided to use. It suited my purposes because it, 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 it comprises a shift of gender that's, that's, that's stark. And um, the interesting fact about that condition is that it comes from a recessive mutation and it's only in the world in a few places in Papua New Guinea. So then I started thinking about a small village where this could have happened. I started thinking about my Greek ancestors from Asia Minor and the story started to swell in, in my mind 
and I realized that it would be a story about a gene that passes down through many generations. So at that point, I no longer had a plot that was just a small autobiography of someone's life. I had a, a story going back to 1922 and, and going up. And at that point, the, the basic structure of Middlesex appeared to me in, clair, in clarity. I knew it was going to begin in 1960, where the narrator's born. Then it would go back to 1922, where the grandparents are living and, and getting together. And you would follow the gene from 1922 up until the narrator's born again in 1960. And then I would tell the story of this person's unusual life up into the 70s or, 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 or 90s, in fact. So the, I knew the structure, but I didn't know what would go in to that structure. There's so, so many things in each chapter, as you, as you say. I had to figure out each chapter through writing the chapter many, many times again. And because the structure of the novel resembles a DNA strand in a, in a sense where everything is connected, something might happen on page 300 that refers back to what, on page 50. If I came up with an idea on page 350, it would ripple back through the manuscript and I would have to go back and change it so that either prepare for this thing that I had just invented so that it would seem as though everything was planned. It was not, it was not planned. It was, it was finessed, you know, because you can't plan it. There's too many things in that book to plan. And um, I find that if you plan everything, you will come up with more commonplace ideas. If you sit, you know, before you write something, you say, well, this will happen, and this will happen, and that will happen. When I do that, the, the things that happen are not that interesting. They're, they're just more cliche. But if I'm writing the story and involved in it, I'll get a different idea that I never would have thought of before. And it'll be a better idea, but of course, then it won't. It needs to be prepared for. So you go back and, and you put the stuff in. It's like you, you build a big house and you realize it's going to fall apart. So you go in and you put a new strut in the basement so the thing doesn't collapse. Yeah. Yes? Um, can you expand a bit on submitting your story to the Paris Review as a young writer? Yeah. Um, the question is about submitting the, the Virgin Suicides to the Paris Review as a young writer. Um, I had submitted other things to the Paris Review, and uh, they hadn't been accepted. I moved to New York, um, and I met one of the editors, or associate editors at the magazine. Um, and I started sending stuff to him. And then finally, the Virgin Suicides um, you know, got through the slush pile and through everything to a close, you know, closer chance of getting accepted. I remember, actually, it was interesting because they got down to two stories. And um, they were going to use one for the next issue. And, it, and Jennifer Egan and, and I were the two two stories, and they had to give it to George Plimpton. And we were both. We, this, I remember it this way, but I'd have to ask Jenny if she if she remembers it this way. But we were we were both there, and we knew George was reading it. This is probably a dream I had. <laughs> you were both in the room. We were pool. both at the at his old yeah, right by the pool right. table. Anyway, and and he was going to use one for the next magazine, and. Um, Fortunately for me, he chose the Virgin Suicides, and then obviously he's gone on to great success too. But I remember both of us like hoping to get in at the same time. I think they used hers later on. And at that point, did you know that it was operating as an excerpt, or did you think this is a story, it can be a story? I thought it was a novel at that point. You did? Yeah, I knew it was a novel at that point. I was more worried that, oh, can they publish it since it's, since it's definitely not a story. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's how it, that's you know that's how it happened. George was like in his underwear, and I gave it to him, and he said, "All right, this one," and it worked out. It worked out. Yes. Uh, I noticed a lot of people in this room are, are very young, uh, and so it seems like your book has a lot of cross-generational appeal, or it keeps finding new new audiences. Uh, do you have a sense of how, uh, like, in your interaction with readers, uh, do you maybe? The question is that he's he's looking at the author on stage and he's struck by the the youth, uh, in contradistinction of the of the audience. Um, and w is there a reason that I think I have a young audience or um, different ages as well as young people? Um,
I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I didn't know it, perhaps, when I wrote The Virgin Suicides, that I, I am an arrested adolescent, and, and I think I'm able to still write about that time. It was a very vivid part of our, my life. I meet people sometimes, and they hated high school, and they never want to think about it again. I'm the, I'm the opposite. That's all I want to think about. <laughs> I don't know why I'm trying to get over it. Um, <laughs> So I think maybe, maybe that is is the reason. I just remember it well, and it's not that different. Things change, the phones change, um, texting happens, and then there's all these different things. But the essential feelings don't don't change. So I think if I remember them, they still ring ring true for for younger younger readers. The, this book is is I found odd in in a way because the you know. Female readers will tell me that they they feel you know that I got the girls right or that the you know they really think I I understand girls and and, and I I think it's funny because the boys who narrate the story don't really understand the girls but there's a kind of emptiness at the center of the book that allows people to project their own experience on, onto the girls and and I don't know if this is true because I'm 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 not a woman but I think when women read it sometimes. That's that's what's happening. Maybe maybe men do it too. The the, the emptiness is, is filled. Um, one of the great things about reading is that you you know readers co-create the the work. The images that each of us have in our in our heads when we read a book are, are all distinct, and it's different than watching a movie. It's like part of it is happening in your in your own brain. So a book like this, where there is an emptiness, I think allows readers to to do that sort of leap in, and I I think. Um, that, that allows for all different kinds of ages to be able to identify with the characters. Yes? I was uh, rereading the marriage plot recently, and I noticed that uh, you described the character of Leonard as someone who wore like a bandana and shoots it back. And I immediately thought of uh, David Foster Wallace, and I was wondering if that was intentional for the characterization on your part. And if not, then sort of how did you bring out that character? The, the question is whether um, Leonard Bankhead's uh, the character in the marriage plot was based or connected in any way with David Foster Wallace because he wore a bandana and chewed tobacco. Um, not the first time I've, I've gotten the, the question. Leonard Bankhead is disguised. Um, and I put a bandana on him to disguise him. And I did it so well that everyone thinks it's David Foster Wallace because of, of the bandana. And unfortunately, while I was writing the book, he, you know, he he died, so it, it brought more attention to it, and and um, than than I than I expected. Um, it's not based on him. I kn I knew him. I was friendly with him, but I didn't know him well enough to to put him into a character, and wouldn't have done done so anyway. So it's it's not him. There's a couple of things like that that make it seem like it's him. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more. Sure. I read all your books in Italian because I am Italian. How does it feel to, to know that your book has, you know, other, other words and can cross the borders of your America and your Midwest? America? I just got the copy of Fresh Complaint, the new Italian version, and I have to say it looks very stylish. I mean, it looks so, so nice. The last book, not so much. They had a kind of two lovers wrapped up in a snaky coil. But the new one is nice. Um, what, I've, what I've found is that if the more specific you are, the more universal something is. If I try to write a, you know, something that would appeal to Europeans or appeal to other countries, um, it probably wouldn't work. But if I just write about my own little town in Michigan, then I find that people in small towns in Italy or small towns in the Netherlands will say that's that's just what it was like. People were nosy and they did this or that. So, the the way to the universal is 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 you know in, through the navel in a, in a sense. That's that's how I do it. I mean, you don't know if it's going to make sense to anybody in a different culture or not. You just you just hope that'll happen. Great. Um, well, okay. thank you all. I think, Jeff, you're going to sign. I'm going to sign, yes. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.